Thank you very much, uh, me and Joseph and everyone else who put this uh, workshop together. So yeah, uh, as, as we mentioned, this is a bit changing a bit the, the, the track. And I, I realize that most of you probably didn't come here today to learn about theater and to learn about Indonesian theater, of all things. But what I'll try to see is, I, I won't focus too much in the specific content. I'll just mention some basic things about this, just for the sake of the argument. But really what I'm interested in doing is what happens if we take something that is not fact-based, that's one of the questions uh, mentioned earlier, and what does it mean when we collect things as if they were data, when we process them computationally? And I'm specifically interested in what that means for teaching, how we can use these boundary case studies for teaching both students in engineering and technical uh, backgrounds, but also people that are coming from the humanities, how they can collaborate, and uh, what that means for, for the future of research and of teaching. So again, just very briefly, this is the only uh, theater slide in my talk. This is one of the things I'll be talking about is something called Wayang Kulit. So this is a tradition of shadow poetry from Java in Indonesia. And uh, most of my work is about this tradition. It's a millionaire tradition that goes back about a thousand years and related forms. So for example, we'll have some dances that are based on these puppetry traditions. So even though it's very, uh, it's very common, it's, it's one of the most respected uh, uh, traditions of the fourth most uh, populous country in the world, and yet there are very few resources uh, that we can use, at least very few resources that are in a machine-readable format that are computationally amenable. So one of the things that we had to, to do at the beginning was to find our own data sources. We don't work in a, in a, in a data-rich environment, unfortunately, in these areas. We're still at the very uh, beginnings of what it means to work with data in fields such as uh, theater studies and the study of culture. So often this meant that we had to create our own resources. For example, this is something called the Contemporary Wayang Archive that was done with funding from the uh, Ministry of Education, the Singapore Ministry of Education, and in collaboration with Indonesian institutions. And this is an archive where you have certain videos. You can go watch the videos with subtitles and explanations. You can go and learn uh, about these performances by watching them. But also, what is really interesting for us is that everything that we put online, it's, uh, it's data, or it can be used as a source of data. So we tried as much as possible to make these resources uh, machine readable and computationally amenable. So we have, for example, things such as videos. I'll be talking about that in a moment. We have subtitles, so that's text. We also have visitors to these websites. So they're also being used for different MOOCs, for different learning uh, 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 situations. We're also interested in knowing how people on, uh, interact with these videos. So anyways, there are all sorts of data that can be obtained from a website like this. That, uh, Another uh, thing that we're doing is, uh, for example, creating these, uh, a data-driven character dictionary. So we ha there are all these characters that are important for these mythological stories that are part of these theater traditions. And there are all sorts of uh, dictionaries, of encyclopedias of characters that have been produced. What we're trying to do is to do uh, data-driven dictionaries that can be used in multiple uh, uh, formats. They can be used for people who want to learn about this tradition, but also perhaps for people who want to learn, for example, about social network analysis, how they can use this. At the moment, we have all our code in uh, GitHub. Uh, you can explore it at your leisure. It's not fully ready. And we're working on a separate website with an API that can be used uh, uh, for uh, going a bit deeper into uh, things such as network analysis of these uh, character relations. So uh, I'm going to be give a very uh, short overview of certain projects that I've done with my collaborators on how we can use the resources from, from these websites as data. Uh, the very first one that I'm talking about is about a video. So we have a relatively small collection of video. But uh, one thing that, that is interesting in this case is that these are all uh, two-dimensional uh, shadow puppets. So it's relatively, they have very standard uh, uh, parameters that are easy for us to uh, compare and to find certain uh, 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 patterns in, in the data. So one thing that we did uh, for a very early experiment with, uh, with one of my collaborators was to do some basic video processing of these videos. So we found something called a difference image, which uh, uh, probably a lot of people here are just uh, familiar with, which is we just look at the amount of pixels that were different between one uh, uh, frame and the next that were above a certain threshold. And they then by, by plotting that as a function of time, as you can see here, you can start to see these uh, these patterns that tend to emerge time and again when we look at these videos. So, so if you can see there at number seven, there usually tends to be a moment where, the, the, uh, regardless of the duration of the performance, there's a moment where the, 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 the average speed dips suddenly. And that tends to coincide with uh, comic interludes in these performances. 
And there are many other uh, features, many other patterns that emerge by looking at the data in this way. But we were interested in looking at something that was relatively easy to explain. This is not computationally complex by any measure. It's very easy to explain to people, uh, both those with a technical background and those without it, what we're doing here. And also, it's very easy to then uh, distribute this as code. So part of a, of a new project is to be able to uh, make a, a, a production-grade version of this software so that then people start to make certain uh, uh, ways of analyzing the videos that they have. So people are having uh, growing collections of video. And usually, they don't know exactly what kind of questions to ask from video. Uh, video processing is, of course, a very mature area of research. And people that are working in, in machine learning and video processing, there are all sorts of techniques that you could also apply to study this. But for an, an initial project, we were interested in finding something simple and something that would be easy for people to, to, to start grappling with what it means to treat this as data. To give an analogy, in uh, the, the, the study of literature, the computational study of literature, which is a longer, uh, uh, an area with a longer history, a lot of people are looking at things that started just by counting words. So, the, so, so a lot of the earlier studies of literature would just look at very simple things that are not computationally complex that had to do with just counting words. And sometimes even just dis uh, discovering what was the most frequent word or the most frequent a series of words from a particular writer changed how literary scholars thought about what they were doing. So that, that, that's, again, there are a lot more complicated things that you can do, but this is an initial phase where you can start treating what you have as data. And we don't have an equivalent for that for video. So, so part of the motivation with this project was to start thinking about what that could be. And here again, we just count at this very simple measure, which is the, the difference in pixels as a function of time. And that itself changes how people can then interact with the videos. Uh, there's another version of this, which is interactive, so that you can go back to the videos. This can be used also for segmentation and for different uh, purposes. Another example is a, a network analysis of these way encoded characters. So here, uh, uh, what we did for this particular project is that we found this uh, co-occurrence network. A, a lot of people here have been uh, speaking about network analysis as well. So we were interested in seeing how these characters, when they, they, they tend to be in the same scene as another character, and what kind of patterns emerge. So we see certain structures that are common that are often found in real world ne networks. One thing that, that we were uh, fascinated to see is that this, this particular network shares a lot of properties with real world networks. Uh, maybe more so than a lot of other mythological networks that have been analyzed for the same kind of properties. And then uh, here also, if, if you click on any of these uh, characters, I'm trying to see one that is a, is a good example. If you click on any one of these characters, you get to see different uh, uh, information, uh, some of it quantitative, some of it uh, which is just basic uh, information about these characters, uh, like the stories where they're found, descriptions, origin, uh, family relations, that this is generated uh, automatically and uh, network measurements. So, so here you have certain things like you know, degree, width to degree, and uh, you have explanations also about what these things mean. So again, the, the purpose of this resource is that people might use it to learn a bit about this specific thing in case they happen to be interested in why I character networks. But even if they're interested in a more general technical application such as social network analysis or uh, network analysis in general, they can use, these, they can, uh, use the data produced by this, uh, served by this API and do their own visualizations, perhaps their own apps, and uh, other kinds of analysis as well. So that's one of the projects. And uh, the other project uh, is about the biomechanics of Japanese dance. So what we did here was looked at versions of the, of the, of the same uh, 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 puppet plays. So, so they have been adapted for, for human puppets, if you like. So now there's, they have dancers that try to do the same kinds of things that the puppets were doing. So, um, you have different kinds of character types that we've identified here. So these are all taken from what people usually describe in the relevant uh, literature. So you have, uh, you know, like Luru, Lanyap, Gaga. These are all different kinds of, of, uh, of, of characters. This one over here, Jatayu, is the name of a mythical bird that has uh, an important role in the, uh, in, in the Mahabharata, in one of the stories. So in collaboration with people from the uh, uh, biomedical engineering, what we did was this uh, motion capture. So we had like a, a very simple movement, which is a, a dancer standing up. And we recorded the exact same movement uh, uh, according to each of the character types. And then we were interested in measuring the differences between these things. So in one simple visualization here, you can see, so, so, so here we're seeing like the angle of the, of the left knee. So these are the, 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 the angles that indicate how the degree of uh, uh, flexion. So the, the higher up you go, uh, 
the more uh, uh, flexed the knee is, and here it's extended. So if, if you, you can see that if, if you mouse over, you can easily go between the video and the uh, and the graph, and you can explore this for any uh, of the different joints that we've looked at. Uh, we also have certain comparisons, so you can uh, do a one-on-one -on -one comparison between one uh, and the other. You also have these. Uh, uh, comparison matrix where you can look at the data here and, and see how there are differences between different character types according to different uh, types of uh, uh, of joints. And then we also start looking at, at the range of motion uh, of these characters and, and, and get to see how, how, how there are certain uh, uh, patterns that, that, uh, that emerge. Uh, well, I, I won't show you, uh, I won't go into that in detail. Feel free to look at it if anybody is interested. But what I want to, the, the point that I want to drive home is that we can use this to teach people about Japanese dance. Maybe they can learn to look at it differently. It also provides a more precise vocabulary to describe motion, but also to, to teach basic uh, uh, aspects of the mechanics uh, of human motion. So certain things sometimes are hard to explain. In this case, it's so easy to decompose the movements uh, that it's uh, relatively easy to explain the basics to students at different levels. Also, all of our data will be available to be uh, uh, currently on GitHub, but we're also working with the research data management programs of NUS so that people can uh, reuse this data. At the moment, our data set is too small to do any significant uh, comparison across uh, types of dances or geographical locations, but we're hoping that more people will contribute this kind of data in the future and that we'll start to see patterns about how things change through time or through uh, according to other variables. So, okay. Uh, moving on, one set of that is how we can do this computational analysis of some of these data that we have. But we're also interested in what this means for how you present that data to other people, both to specialists, but uh, especially to the, to the general audience. So a lot of people are perhaps interested in learning more about uh, dance and theater. Many, many of the students that are coming from technical disciplines uh, come to our, to our courses also with an interest in learning a bit more about, about these forms. And sometimes just going to a library and encountering a, a normal printed book, it's a bit of a daunting process, and it's not the, the most convenient way to learn about these things. Uh, dance and theater are highly interactive. They're uh, uh, multi-sensory experiences. So sometimes having uh, uh, interfaces that build upon this might be more useful. So in this case, I mean, uh, this is one example of, of a website uh, where you can see different uh, essays that are uh, explanations about, the, about these uh, dances, but also uh, diagrams, uh, interactive diagrams with explanations about how these performances are similar or different from one another. And there are also combinations of video and text. And we also see how people actually use it. So we have analytics about how people use these resources. And we're interested in, in seeing how people jump uh, from one explanation to the, to the other, or how they interact from video and text, and what kinds of uh, pathways emerge. Another thing that we're looking at, this is something that we just exhibited recently at the Singapore, uh, uh, the Art Science Museum. So we were interested also in making these tangible user interfaces. So in this case, we bring the actual puppets uh, that are part of this tradition, and we wire them with uh, sensors control connected to an Arduino microcontroller. And we're interested in trying to explain to people what are these uh, motor skills that are important in the manipulation of the puppets. This is something that is very difficult to explain by other means, and it's only when you actually when you have the actual uh, objects that it's easier to get a sense of how they're used in performance. So in this case, the sensors give you uh, feedback on what are the, the, the appropriate or the conventional ways to use certain puppets, and then you get videos that, that explain to you what is happening. So, uh, so again, this is an ongoing uh, uh, experiment in how we can develop other kinds of interfaces that go beyond a simple GUI into tangible uh, uh, user interfaces that are more suited to this particular kind of uh, uh, content, to, 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 to a theater uh, context. OK, so just to uh, wrap up, I want to speak a bit more about what are the challenges for teaching uh, uh, how to do this kind of work. So for the, for the research that is behind these projects, I tend to work in interdisciplinary teams with people that are coming from traditional theater backgrounds, but also from engineering, mathematics, computer science. And often, uh, we find that even though we have similar interests, the people that tend to get drawn to these projects are people who are already slightly interested in interdisciplinary perspectives. So the question for us now is how do we train students that are at, uh, at undergraduate levels in very specialized courses to think 
interdisciplinary. Uh, interdisciplinary. So uh, one course that we've been uh, developing as the general education model over the past uh, three years is uh, digital humanities and arts research. And what we want to achieve with this ideally is an introduction to data-driven research in the humanities. So it's not specifically about theater, but we, we, we try to show students that a lot of really fascinating questions can be asked when you treat things that come from the historical record. They can be books, they can be videos, they can be uh, all sorts of documents from the past. And uh, we introduce them to corpus linguistics, network analysis, and a set of uh, GIS tools. And the idea is that they have to do a, a simple data-driven individual exercise, but also work together with groups of students from other disciplines in imagining what a resource like this could be like. So this is aimed at students both from computing and humanities backgrounds. And uh, we also do year to year experiments in content and in teaching modes. So I, uh, I was actually very excited to hear about the, 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 the data lay, and these are things that we would love to, to, uh, to use more in the future, because we want to see also how people are using, for example, the different resources that we have online, combining with, with, with things that are uh, on the IDLE platform, but also some of the, of the platforms that we've developed specifically for teaching these, these skills. Because one, one of the main challenges for teaching these courses is that uh, we tend to be very idealistic about this. So the people who, who teach this, uh, we believe strongly that there is something to be gained by this interdisciplinary approach to teaching and learning, of using these objects that don't fit nicely into one discipline, and that you can look at it from multiple perspectives. In principle, a lot of people also agree with that. If you would ask the students, they would also say they agree with that. But then when it comes to the actual practical challenges of a, of a classroom situation, it's very difficult to do something that suits everyone. So what ends up, uh, ends up happening is that most people are very excited at the beginning, but they end up being very disappointed because the, the course is too general and half of the course would be too basic for some of the people and too complex for others. So for example, we try to uh, teach some basics of programming to get everyone on the same level, but it's very difficult to find the right balance because most uh, uh, students that come from technical backgrounds would find this uh, ridiculously easy and they would see, uh, they wouldn't find, find it interesting. And then when we uh, teach this to, compute, to students that are coming from the humanities disciplines, they find it perhaps too, too complex or too obscure. And then when we talk about things that are uh, second uh, nature in the humanities, they're too abstract, too uh, ambiguous. It's very difficult to explain to an engineering student why this matters. So again, usually our experience is that they tend to enjoy when they work together. They tend to enjoy these experiences when they're working in these joint teams. But it's very difficult to get to the point where, we're, where we know what kinds of skills are suited uh, to different groups of students. So. Uh, we'd be interested also uh, in exploring in the future whether we can do a more uh, customized uh, learning experience where depending on where you're coming from, you can learn different things in the same module. Of course, there are certain restrictions for this from, from the point of view of an institution. This is very difficult to grade, it's very difficult to justify, but we're interested in knowing uh, whether we could develop platforms where depending on your background, you get to do different things throughout the semester even though you all converge ideally towards the end for one shared assignment. So uh, we've been also collecting some basic data on this. We also use uh, Archipelago. So uh, uh, the, the, we, we've been uh, really uh, interested in, in using uh, Archipelago. So that, that, uh, uh, if the people who develop it are still here, so thank you very much for doing this uh, amazing platform. And one, one thing that has surprised me about how we use uh, this is that also at the beginning, we were interested in using this as a way to measure participation, which didn't work. Uh, and we uh, experimented with different kinds of questions. And often what we realized is that asking very simple questions that are not so much about <coughs> enforcing what we're learning, but just breaking up the, uh, uh, in a way, the, the pace of the lecture and asking simple things about the students actually improved engagement later on. So you can see like the example over here, like it's framed as an MCQ question, but it just asks them about the background. So this is a, the, one of the first questions that we have in the first lecture. So we start talking about what we're going to be doing. And then we ask about their background, in how much do they know, about, if they have any training in any uh, programming language, if they've done any computer courses in the past, and what exposure to the humanities they have so far. And 
what we realize is that the more we ask questions about what they think, about who they are, about what they're experiencing as we go through the module, that this actually um, encourages uh, better participation in the, in the exercises. So that's something that we want to uh, uh, keep exploring. And again, there are uh, many different uh, uh, challenges, but also we uh, hope that through these interdisciplinary uh, collaborations, we can find different ways to, uh, to solve different problems, both in teaching and research. So thank you very much.